Ezekiel chapter 12, we'll begin by reading the whole chapter. The word of the Lord also came unto me, saying, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Therefore, thou, son of man, prepare thee stuff for removing, and remove by day in their sight. And thou shalt remove from thy place to another place in their sight. It may be they will consider, though they be a rebellious house. Then shalt thou bring forth thy stuff by day in their sight as stuff for removing. And thou shalt go forth at even in their sight as they that go forth into captivity. Dig thou through the wall in their sight and carry out thereby. In their sight thou shalt bear it upon thy shoulders, and carry it forth in the twilight. Thou shalt cover thy face, that thou see not the ground. For I have set thee for a sign unto the house of Israel. And I did so as I was commanded. I brought forth my stuff by day as stuff for captivity. And in the even I digged through the wall with my hand. I brought it forth in the twilight and I bear it upon my shoulder in their sight. And in the morning came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, hath not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said unto thee, What doest thou? Say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, This burden concerneth the prince in Jerusalem, and all the house of Israel that are among them. Say, I am your sign. Like as I have done, so shall it be done unto them. They shall remove and go into captivity. And the prince that is among them shall bear upon his shoulder in the twilight and shall go forth. They shall dig through the wall to carry out thereby. He shall cover his face that he see not the ground with his eyes. My net also will I spread upon him and he shall be taken in my snare and I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet shall he not see it, though he shall die there. And I will scatter toward every wind all that are about him to help him, and all his bands, and I will draw out the sword after them. And they shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall scatter them among the nations and disperse them in the countries. But I will leave a few men of them from the sword, from the famine, and from the pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the heathen, whither they come, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, eat thy bread with quaking, and drink thy water with trembling, and with carefulness. And say unto the people of the land, Thus saith the Lord God, of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and of the land of Israel, they shall eat their bread with carefulness, and drink their water with astonishment, that her land may be desolate from all that is therein, because of the violence of all them that dwell therein. And the cities that are inhabited shall be laid waste, and the land shall be desolate, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is that proverb that ye have in the land of Israel, saying, the days are prolonged, and every vision faileth. Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease. And they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but say unto them, The days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. For there shall no more, there shall be no more any vain vision, nor flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged. And in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word, and will perform it, saith the Lord God. Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, The vision that he seeth is for many days to come. And he prophesieth of times that are far off. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, saith the Lord. 
talking today about the type of removing. The type of removing. That's the first portion of Ezekiel chapter 12 here. Now, Ezekiel was a hard-headed prophet. As, as seers, as preachers, uh, we can be accused of, and I have been accused of, of course, of being, being, being cold in our boldness. In other words, just kind of relentless, not thinking about the feelings of others. We have a hard heart, apparently, and, and, we, and we, we beat people with a burden. Nowhere, though, does this come more true as, as among our own people. Quite often when delivering messages to our own people, family, church, friends, and you've experienced this, you went to preach to people and they're like, you're being hard-hearted. You're, you're, you, this is a hate message. This, this is hurtful to me. And, and people get very easily offended, especially in your own circle. Correct? Your family members don't like the preaching. People that know you and have known you all your life. Church members, when there's a disagreement, consider somebody to be hard-hearted. You're, you're just not willing to bend when somebody has a conviction and another has an opposite conviction. Among friends, it's the same thing. Delivering messages to your own people, quite often you can get accused of being cold in your boldness or having a hard heart when really you have a warm heart that is, is burdened. You're trying to portray a message. And salvation is one of those, those, those areas where when you preach it to somebody, sometimes they'll think that you're being, you're being hard-hearted. But really, you just have a soft, warm heart to somebody you want them to hear the gospel. Ezekiel is one of these called hard-headed preachers. Go to Ezekiel 3, and verse 1. Ezekiel 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll. And go and speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. So here, at the beginning of the commission of Ezekiel the prophet, God says, take this roll, take this word that I'm giving unto you, and eat it up. Ezekiel describes it as a sweet word, as a sweet roll as he takes it in. He says, in my belly it was sweet, in his mouth as honey for sweetness. In Revelation, we read about a few pages back where John did the same. He took a roll and he ate it and he said, in my mouth it was sweet as honey, but in my belly it was bitter. And this is what happens sometimes. You'll receive the word from God, and it tastes sweet unto you. But in your delivery of the same, suddenly your, your bowels don't feel so, so, so sweet to it. it it's, it's bitter. It, seem, it seems hurtful. It seems harmful. That often happens in the realization that what I have learned from the Bible is sweet to me, but as I present it to somebody else, it's going to be bitter. And that bitterness comes into my own stomach as I'm like, God wants me to share the gospel with my grandmother, but it's going to offend her. Oh, that sweet, blessed psalm, that sweet, blessed verse, you know, God so loved the world, it's not going to be received by them in the same way, and it hurts my stomach. And so Ezekiel, I believe, had the same in his commission, where he received a word, and he's like, that is sweet, that is, that is good. But I believe he also had the bitter realization that we saw John shared with us, that as it comes to the point where he must deliver it, it's going to feel bitter unto him. But when we're on the side of right with regard to God's word, his word always seems sweet to us. When we're sitting there in a sermon about sins that don't belong unto us, the preaching of the word seems oh so sweet. I talked about that in the challenge accepted sermon, how people hear the word of God, and this is great, this is wonderful, but as soon as the preaching turns to something that applies to them, it, now, now I hate this preaching. Now I hate this preacher. Now I hate this message. Right? They, we can change on a dime when, when suddenly the sweet word becomes bitter because it applies directly to us. When we're on the side of right, when we're on the side of God's will, every word that he has is it not sweet as honey. I'm guilty of none of it, and so all of it feels good. It seems good. It, it's great. I'm on the side of right. 
It's sweet to taste. The Bible says in Psalm 34, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. But if we're not trusting God, then is His Word always sweet in taste? Do we see God or the messenger of God as something that is good to us? Too often we, we get bitter when the Bible comes at us and, and, it's, and it's, it's not positive. It's not something that we are, we are clear of or clean of. If you're not trusting, if you're doubting, if you're on fear, are, are you being blessed? <laughs> Psalm 34 reveals, hey, no. If you're trusting in him, blessed is that man. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And, and the blessed man who is trusting God, who's not doubting, who's not in fear, can, can experience that. But that same word is not always so sweet when delivered unto somebody that is doubting. Someone that is feeling, feeling fear and not trusting in God to the fullest at that particular moment. Back in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 4 reads, And he said unto me, Son of man, go! Get thee into the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. So his command and commission is to speak with the words of God. He says, speak with my words. Ezekiel has just eaten the words, taken them into his mouth and into his belly, and they were sweet. And now God says, go and speak these unto them. Who? To the house of Israel. Verse 5, for thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of unhard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech or of an hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. Imagine hearing that from God. You're going to go speak to these people. You've just taken in the word and it's really sweet to you. This, this is great. He says, go and speak these same words unto this people. Okay, I can do that. But then God gives the introduction to who you're speaking to. And he says, they won't hearken unto thee. These of a foreign language and of a strange speech, they would have received me and understood. And probably in the same sweetness that you've received, they received the message that you're bringing. But these people, surely had I sent you to them, you might have gotten through to them. But these people, Israel, what does he say of them? Verse 7, But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee. For they will not hearken unto me. Good thing to remember when people don't hear or hearken unto your words. If you're preaching his words, as God commissioned his, uh, Ezekiel, if you're speaking with the Lord's words unto them, it's not you that they're rejecting. The house of Israel will not hearken unto thee. Why? Because they will not hearken unto me, the Lord says. For they all, for all the house of Israel are imputant and hard-hearted. He says of the people of Israel that they're impudent, they have no respect, they have no regard, they have no fear of the Lord, and they're hard-hearted. That means they're set in their ways. That means they're fixed. That means they're not budging from the position that they're in. They know they're right and they're not going to move from that. No matter what God says, no matter who God sends to say it. Now, I believe we ought to thank God for the preacher that preaches to you. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we ought to thank God for the, the word that you're hearing, whether it be from a brother or sister in Christ, whether it be from me, whether who, whoever you're hearing the word of God from. Mm -hmm. The preacher that is faithful to preach to who he is sent is, is, is a rarity these days. We ought to be thankful for somebody that would accept the call of God, as Ezekiel did, to go and preach unto a specific people his words. That's rare. Do you know what we find instead? Preachers that would, would look at the scenario, here's a hard-hearted and impudent people, and here's a people of a foreign language, that would receive you. And they'll hear the call of God that says, go speak my words unto the hard-hearted. And they'll say, I think God's calling me unto this field. And they'll go after the, the field that's easy, that's going to be receptive, that's going to be, right? 
When we go soul winning, there is definitely wisdom in going to where it's receptive. Uh, don't get me wrong. But there's something about somebody that takes a call to minister to a group that is not willing to hear it and just sticks with it, okay? Going to where they are sent and then sticking with that particular calling. And when that happens, when God sends a preacher to a specific person, God always gets what he wants out of that message, okay? So if God sends me by divine appointment to somebody at a gas station, and we've had those moments where it was just like the stars were aligned and it was just the perfect timing for us to cross paths so that that person that was ready to get saved got saved. That's God sending me, sometimes unbeknownst to me, to a specific person with a specific message. I was faithful to follow through and then God's will was they'd be saved and they were saved. The same is true when God sends a preacher who preaches anyway to somebody who's not necessarily receptive or wanting to hear it, but he sends them, he sends the preacher to them, and you will see that what is preached unto them, though they don't receive it, is often exactly what was necessary for them to hear. God still had his way and his will fulfilled, even in the rejection of the message. Okay? Be thankful for messages from God, no matter who it comes from, no matter how it makes you feel, it's a special thing when God sends a man to speak to you, his words, okay? We ought to be receptive and, and soft-hearted to those messages, but hey, sometimes I hear messages and I'm a little hard-hearted to them. They come across the pulpit of a friend of mine and I'm like, right? I get angry, I get upset, I get uptight. Right? But several days later, after I've let that thing work in me, suddenly I'm like, oh, man, I'm so thankful God did that. I'm so thankful he, he put it on his heart to preach to me in that way. Right? Be thankful for that. Verse 8 will continue. It says, Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces. You see how God took a hard-hearted people and said a hard-faced, hard-foreheaded, hard man to them? Exactly what they needed. He says, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint have I made that forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. God sent a hard-headed preacher to a hard-hearted people. God knew what they needed. And so then, we see that having a hard head is not always a bad thing. It means you're not going to move. It means you're not going to budge. That means that the, that the message that's coming across is going to bulldoze its way into the hard hearts of these people, whether they like it or not. And yet he's still affirmed to his preacher. He says, be not afraid. Fear them not. Neither be dismayed by their looks, though they be a rebellious house. I've given you a hard head, just with their hard hearts needed. Mm -hmm. Verse 10 continues and it says moreover he said unto me son of man all my words that I shall speak unto thee receive in thine heart and hear with thine ears and go get thee to them of the captivity unto the children of thy people and speak unto them and tell them thus saith the Lord God whether they will hear whether they will forbear Ezekiel's call was to go and say thus saith the Lord God whether they heard it or not whether they liked it or not in 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 season and out of season, he was sent to give exactly the message that God gave unto him. What it says at the end of verse 10, it says, Receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears, and go. The same thing happens to me all the time. And I don't know if I'm hitting on somebody specifically when I preach a message, but I've heard in my heart, received it in my heart. I've heard it with my ears, and I go. I proclaim the message. We do that when we're soul winning. We do that when we're ministering to family members. Whether they will hear it or know, if you've got the word from God and he says, go, bring it. That's our responsibility as preachers, myself and anyone that's here. Preachers are to receive, to hear, and to go, whether the recipients will or no. Ezekiel, he's one of my favorite prophets. He's also a little bit of an anomaly. He often taught with illustration and imagery and types, which makes... Maybe the application a little bit difficult for us standing here in 2020, 
but perhaps at the time it might have made more sense than the people of Israel, okay? Because mm -hmm. he was always doing these illustrations and these signs before them in order to get his message across. Look in chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile and lay it before thee, and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. Lay siege against it, and build a fort against it, and cast a mount against it. Set the camp also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. That image, that illustration, that sign was basically like, Ezekiel, I want you to make a Lego house out of, it, out of Israel. I want you to build a little portrayal of the city. And then I want you to just obliterate and smash this thing. Make little enemies for them. Draw them off. Right? He's, he's like, Ezekiel, go play with toys, man, in front of these people. Yeah. Okay, God, I, I guess I'll do that, right? He was led in his ministry to go and do something that seems very peculiar to us. Nevertheless, he was faithful to do so. He laid out that image, that portrayal of Jerusalem, and then laid siege to that thing in order to teach a spiritual truth. You can go and you can look over in verse 14, or 15. It says, Then said he unto me, Lo, I have given thee cow's dung. Whoa, where are we here? For man's dung, thou shalt prepare thy bread therewith. What in the world is he talking about? Well, back in verse 9, it said, Take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches and put them in a vessel and make bread thereof. He was to make bread, but then God said this thing, Make it with dung that cometh out of a man. Now, I don't believe that he actually put dung in the food and ate it. I believe he likely used it as a fuel to cook the fire, to, use, to heat the fire up, right? Because cakes of, of dung are actually, they'll burn long. It's like a kindling. Gross, right? God says do it with man's dung, and Ezekiel's like, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. And this is just... So God says here in verse 15, Lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung. Here's his consolation. And thou shalt prepare thy bread therewith. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they shall eat bread by weight and with care. And they shall drink water by measure and with astonishment, that they may want bread and water and be astonished one with another and consume away in their iniquity. As a sign for your sin and where you're headed, Ezekiel did this sign. He baked bread in front of them, and he did it with cow's dung, as, as the Bible says here, a, a preparation therewith. Another sign he did in front of the people to where they might have been scratching their heads saying, what is this? And then he would lead into the preaching that explains this is what's happening. Chapter 5 continues in the same vein with Ezekiel. Chapter 5, verse 1, And thou, son of man, take thee a sharp knife, and take thee a barber's razor. I'm liking this sign. I could use a little bit of this right now, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Take thee a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon thine head, and upon thy beard. Then take thee balances to weigh, and divide the hair. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part of it in the midst of the city, and when, when the days of siege are fulfilled. And thou shalt take a third part, and smite about it with a knife. And a third part thou shalt scatter to the wind, and I will draw out a sword after them. And so here's another type where Ezekiel's goal basically to get a haircut and lay it out in thirds. And at specific times of the fulfillment of what God has promised and will come to pass, he would use the hair for that certain illustration of the spiritual truth. And he's trying to portray to the people of Israel. And here, I believe, because of Ezekiel's willingness to obey, and these are things you're not going to exactly find in, you know, chapter and verse. Right? Do we find any examples of these bizarre behaviors in any portion of the scripture where, where you can open it up and say, yeah, okay, thus saith the Lord, make your bread with dung and do it from the people. No. Ezekiel's getting these special revelations from God, and at that time, I believe his willingness to obey, regardless of how he's seen by the people, allowed for God to freely give him open visions of, of extreme things that other people didn't experience. The Apostle Paul said, similar. He's like, I knew such a man. In heaven or above, I cannot tell. And he was describing visions that he had of the third heaven, caught up, and he saw great things which a man cannot even name or say, or describe. And Ezekiel had a similar experience. He was willing to be seen as crazy to preach the truth. 
and do all sorts of these weird illustrations at the command of God so that his message would get across to a hard-hearted people that by and large were rejecting it. Ezekiel was a hard-headed preacher. He had to be to do such, such bizarre activities, I believe. I like the guy for this. I like him a lot. I want, he's one of the first I want to meet. Ezekiel was given great spiritual insight into things angelic. We saw that in the first portions of the scripture where he sees the wheel within the wheel, describing different chariot bands and all of these fantastic sights in front of the throne of God. Also, he's given spiritual insight into the wickedness of the people that he is dealing with. Look at chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8, begin in verse 5. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north. Behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here? that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee again, and thou shalt see greater abomination. So here, he's given this vision where he's swept up in the spirit, and he goes, and he's dropped at the north part, the gate of the altar of the image, and he sees this image of jealousy. In other words, a false god. And God's like, do you see what I'm showing you? Do you see this great and false abomination that is before the people? And I'm certain that Ezekiel nodded and said, yes. But turn thee again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Verse 7, And he brought me into the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. And then he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, the door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jezaniah the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. And so here he sees the idolatry that's going on behind closed doors, even behind a wall that needed to be removed in order for him to see a known man, Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, doing wicked things behind closed doors, behind the scenes. Verse 12, Then said he unto me, Son of man, Hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? Have you seen what the elders, what the responsible, what the older folks are doing, what the leaders are doing behind closed doors? Have you seen this, Son of man? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. Verse 13, it continues, he said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see a greater abomination than they do. Idolatry in public? Idolatry in darkness? I'm going to turn again? Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz, the false god. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. He went from the outer gate of the city to the inner sanctum of the leaders, to the front of the gate of God's house, and found idolatry everywhere. And now he's going to bring him in to the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worship the sun towards the east. It's an affront to God. I'm just going to turn up. I'm physically going to turn away from God and worship the sun to the east. Verse 17, Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah? that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. They went out and evangelized their violence and their wickedness, and then they return unto what should have been God, but they return instead to provoke him 
with anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury, rightfully so. Mine eye shall not spare, amen. Neither shall I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. God's showing Ezekiel. This is why your preaching is the way it is. This is why the revelations I'm giving you are as they are. This is why I sent you and gave you that hard forehead. Because this is your audience. These are the people that are hearing the words that you are preaching. No wonder many, verses, many chapters and verses back, he said, they will not hear you, neither will they regard your reproofs. Ezekiel was given a call, and he was given a determination in his spirit here to divide the nation. He was given the call to draw a line in the sand and say, who will serve God and who will continue in the wickedness that you have seen at the gate, behind closed doors, at the gate of the Lord's house and in his very house for the temple. Draw that line, Ezekiel, he's saying. Divide this nation, let's see who will serve me and who won't. Let's see who will hearken and who won't. Continue on in chapter 9. It says, He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in her hand. Here, I believe in vision, he's given a, a, an actual description of what spiritually is taking place right now. Division. Who will serve God and who won't? Verse 2, it says, And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man his slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with an writer's, writer's inkhorn in his side, by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the Lord, the glory of the God of Israel, was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the men clothed with the linen, which had the writer's inkhorn in his hand. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Go and mark those that are angry, that are sighing, that are weeping, that are crying out to God over the wickedness that has been seen. Go unto those that are fearing God and after Him and begging that God would have mercy for the wickedness that their people are doing. Go unto those that are standing on the right side of the line in the sand and mark them. It says in verse 5, And to the others He said, In mine hearing, Go ye after Him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Begin with the religions. Begin with those in church, essentially. And they began at the ancient men which were before the house, and he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. Here Ezekiel has that call and determination, sees a spiritual truth about what's going on, and revelation to the fact that God is dividing the sheep from the goats. God is dividing those with His mark that sigh and cry after Him from the rest. And when it's done, there will be no pity, no sparing, no mercy for those that are following after the abominable works of the leaders in Jerusalem. Surely there's a remnant saved, and the Bible talks about that in chapter 10 and verse 17. Chapter 10 and verse 17. It says, When they stood, these stood. When they were lifted up, these were lifted up themselves also, for the spirit of living creatures was in them. The glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherry booms. Probably in the wrong chapter there. 
11, verse 17, my apologies. Therefore say, that's a good chapter too, another revelation, vision of the chariot booms, which God gave unto a man Ezekiel who was determined and faithful to preach the word and to hear and receive and give whatever he was expected to. Great visions of spiritual darkness and spiritual blessings and bliss coming from the throne room of God. Here in chapter 11, and verse 17, it says, Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where ye have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. God gives a new heart that they can walk in his statutes. To who? The ones that he's chosen. The ones that he's marked out of the people when judgment comes. The ones who sigh and cry after the abominations and want to seek after God. He takes them and severs them unto himself. But before this, the heart of those that would not hearken, would not hear, is revealed and removed. Their ways recompense then upon their own heads, the Bible reports. They're essentially reaping what they have sown. Verse 21, just after that of chapter 11, says, But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own heads saith the Lord. They will reap what they've sown. They want to go after filth and disgusting abominations. They'll receive filth and disgusting abominations and destruction that comes because of it. Continuing on to chapter 12. Now we're here. Verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord also came unto me, saying, just before that, Verse 24, afterward the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. Then I spake unto them of the captivity all the things that the Lord had shown me. He faithfully preached the word. And then he's going to begin to highlight what that word is. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, whose word? The word of the Lord. Came to who? Ezekiel the preacher with that hard head. Where was he sent? Verse 2, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, sent to a rebellious house, as promised many chapters earlier. Which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. In the midst of a rebellious house was a man of God, a preacher of God, sent to preach the word of God. These rebels, the Bible says, have ears, but hear not. In other words, they have all the physicalities. They have all the faculties. They have every opportunity to hear and to hearken unto what's being said by God. And yet, because of their rebellion, they will not. They refuse. They reject. They rebel from seeing and hearing, though they have every ability to, and opportunity as well. Your ears, right? They work. Your ears are still connected to your brain, your eyes, they see, you're transmitting that, you're capable, you're in front of the preacher, right, is what he's saying here. These have ears to hear. They have eyes to see, and yet they won't because of their rebellious, hardened heart. Therefore, here's what he's going to say to them. This is a scary thing when you think about it. Remember I said we need to be thankful for God sending us preachers, thankful for God sending us his word, Right? What is he now going to command his word to do? Verse 3, Therefore thou, son of man, prepare thee stuff for removing, and remove by day in their sight. He's saying prepare to remove. Prepare to go somewhere else. Prepare to leave in their sight. 
and thou shalt remove from thy place to another place in their sight. His place was in the midst of this rebellious house. He was sent to the hard-hearted with a hard head to preach a specific message. He did so faithfully, had great revelations. Can you imagine the ministry that Ezekiel could have had if he had a receptive audience? With all these visions of heavenly, masterful, wonderful things, and yet they refused even the simplest truth to just trust and obey God and His commands. And so God says, Remove by day in their sight. Thou shalt remove from thy place unto another place. From where you were called and sent to minister unto another place, it may be they will consider. It's kind of like a last-ditch effort to grab a hold of the hearts and minds of the people that he was called to minister to. It may be they will consider, though they be a rebellious house. He says, prepare to remove, peradventure they consider what's going on. Verse 4, it says, Then shalt thou bring forth thy stuff by day in their sight, as stuff for removing... And thou shalt go forth at even in their sight, as they that go forth into captivity. So here is again another sign type illustration from the man, Ezekiel, from the prophet. Hoping that they would understand, he removes and set forth, the Bible says, as they that go forth into captivity. Now why would this be a good illustration? Look at verse 25 of the previous chapter. Then I spake unto them of the captivity, all things that the Lord had showed me. In other words, they were of the captivity, so they understand removing as one that was of the captivity. He gave them something on a, on a what is it, they say, the lowest cookie shelf, right? They put it on the bottom shelf. He made it clear. These of the captivity would certainly understand him gathering his stuff and removing Verse 5 says, dig thou, through, dig thou through the wall in their sight and carry out thereby. This is expressing an urgency to the message and an urgency to the sign and the type that is taking place. It's like when Jesus says in the New Testament, compel them to come in that my house may be filled. He's compelling them now, making, making the message and the illustration urgent. You've got to think, you know, if, if, if you've moved recently or have a recent recollection, sometimes you have to, like, go out through the front door and then up the stairs and then back around and then catch up with the truck that's on the other side of the house. When really, the truck is just, like, right there from the thing that you're moving, right? There's a lot of extra steps involved. But if there was urgency, like Ezekiel is saying, and what God is trying to have them do, he says, dig through the wall in their sight. In other words, instead of going for the long walk with the item, just bust that wall open and go right through giving urgency to the message, urgency to the vision. He's also giving the illustration that you need to break through some obstacles in order to get the message through. It's like an escape that's happening. Verse 6 says, In their sight shalt thou bear it upon thy shoulders, and carry it forth in the twilight. Thou shalt cover thy face, that thou see not the ground, for I have set thee for a sign unto Israel. So it's clear that he is in their sight a sign unto the people of Israel. And here's an application for all of us. Is that as is set for a sign unto the house of Israel, so are you set for a sign to those in your life that are the most hard-hearted, that are the most unreceptive, that are the most uninterested in hearing what you have to say. You are set for a sign before them to the end that it may be they'll consider. Men in our lives, and especially brethren, especially those of the household of God, must see our walks. They must behold our burden. And these days, more and more, they need to see your walk, even if you're going in another direction. We need to direct ourselves to the right side of the line in the sand, to the, to the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and away from the wickedness that is permeating in the churches these days. We need to set ourselves towards God and follow after Him. And it may be that we need to remove ourselves 
from that side of the sand in order to be in the right way. But when we do it, it's not just forsaking those. We've got to be as Ezekiel is. Be there in their sight as a sign of what is right. Be there as God sets us for a sign unto the hard-hearted house of Israel and their rebellion and their wickedness and their compromise and their idolatry and their, you know, literally turning away from God and putting your backs while you do wicked things. Saying, God isn't here. God doesn't see. He's forsaken the earth. I don't think anyone actually says that. Some of them did. But that's the heart that turns from God and wants nothing to do with what he is doing today in this world. So the preacher portrays the message, presents it from his heart as he has heard and received. So go, is the charge to Ezekiel. He's faithful to do it, gives great revelation. The men continually reject him, and so he removes in their sight. The word of God, the ministry of God, the right ways, the right paths, remove from the other way. In their sight. And our brethren, and our family members, and those that we have a burden for, if it gets to the point where we need to remove, we need to see that as a sign. It may be they will consider. Sometimes we have to walk that path, path less travel. Sometimes we have to break through walls in order to get to the destination that God has for us. Sometimes we have to go the opposite way of people that we've called brethren, of people that we would desire to have fellowship with, of people that we would hope would one day see eye to eye with us again because we know that God called us to go and remove. That's what Ezekiel's showing here. That's what he's portraying to his people. He hasn't, he hasn't negated from having the heart for them because he continues to want them to see you know, I wonder if even as he was removing his stuff, if he, if he lingered a little bit just so that another would ask that question. What doest thou? What doest thou? So he could, he could compel them to follow after. Ezekiel did what he did faithfully. Verse 7 says, And I did so as I was commanded. And I believe I stand here today in regard to all of the situation that's going on in this world. I believe that I have done as I was commanded of God. We all have to have that same resolve. It's a, it's a great position to be in when you can look back, and yeah, you've made mistakes, and yeah, you've, you've, you've miffed up a little bit, but by and large, you're on the right path, and you're following the command of God. I brought forth my stuff by day as stuff for captivity. And in the evening I dig through the wall with my hand. I brought it forth in the twilight and I bear it upon my shoulder in their sight. That's, that's key. By his actions in a form of lifestyle evangelism, Ezekiel is showing the way that they ought to go. And sometimes, especially in the face of familiars, our words don't do a lot. Our words will just anger family members, anger friends, anger fellow church members. Sometimes the best thing that we can do is just keep our words and show them how it's done. Okay, that, that, that applies to, to the hardest of heart cases that you have. Everybody's thinking of a family member, right? Just show them how it's done, right? And he did it faithfully in front of his familiars, in front of his people, in front of the people he was to minister to and minister with. Verse 8 it says, And in the morning came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, hath thou not, hath not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said unto thee, What doest thou? Haven't they been asking? What is this about? Ezekiel's probably like, let me tell you. And in a lot of ways, he's probably going back to the messages he originally preached. Hey, you, you remember the hair? Hey, do you remember the dumb? 
And you remember, right? And he's just going back to those illustrations. And also highlighting the fact that now is the time to make the decision for right. Because I'm going to just keep on removing. God has some things for you to do. Verse 10, it continues and says, Say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, This burden concerneth the prince in Jerusalem, and all the house of Israel that are among them. Say, I am your son. This message then, the Bible says, comes to the leaders in Jerusalem, the ones that are leading people astray into idolatry, the ones that are at the tops, of the echelons of the spiritual economy that is going on in Israel at this time. The leaders who are teaching their people to go contrary to God, following off away from the Lord. He says, this message is to them. Say, verse 11, I am your sign. Like as I have done, so shall it be done unto them. They shall remove into captivity. He says, I am the sign to the leaders. I am the sign to the people that follow after them that they will, like it or not, go into captivity. He says, as I am going now alone and into solitude, I do it willingly. Because that's what, is, that's what he's doing. God said it. He started doing it. He's like, he's pre-packing. No one else is packing. No one else is preparing. Where are you going? What are you doing? What's he says, I'm your sign. This is going to come to pass because of your abomination. Because of your wickedness. I'm removing. I'm out of here. I'm getting out. God wants me to go. He's saying this. I am doing it willingly. One day they will go by force. That's what he says there in verse 11. Like as I have done, right? I've done this. I've packed up and removed, busted through the wall. Get out of here as fast as I can, trying to portray something to you. As I have done, this is going to be done unto you, and you will not have a choice. He's talking about the captivity of the Babylonian prince. Continue on, verse 12, it says, And the prince that is among them shall bear upon his shoulder. This shall be done. When do princes bear anything? Don't they have guys for that? Don't they have people that work around them and they would lift their things and help them carry it? It's showing you that there's some sort of equal playing field that's happening. As the prince, so is the pauper, right? They're all just on the same plane when it comes to a catastrophe that is coming. The prince will bear for himself. He won't have his position of prestige or his aides or people to help him or his servants when judgment comes. Verse 12, And the prince that is among them shall bear upon his shoulder in the twilight, and shall go forth. They shall dig through the wall to carry out thereby. So in twilight, that's when this will take place, the prince bearing for himself in twilight, which to us is what? That's when you're waking up, so you're waking up refreshed and you have rest. Or it's the time when you're about to, to get rest. And you're, and you're about to lay down and get comfortable, right? In that twilight, in that interim. The time when they should have rest, they're actually going to be overtaken. Removed by force. It continues and says, He shall cover his face and he shall not see the ground. Face covered. That indicates no vision. That indicates that they must be led of another. As I read this, I wondered if that isn't the same thing with the masks. We're all just indicating that we have no vision. We must be left light of another. We cannot see the ground as we walk. We'll trip unless somebody else leads us along the way. To the world, that's the Antichrist. There's symbology to all this stuff that's going on. Spiritual wickedness in high places is just like puppet masters moving along the powers that be, right? So you can see things like this, you know. What's the symbology of a mask? What's the symbology of me of me having to get my forehead scanned every day? Where's that going? What's the direction of that, right? Verse 13 says, My net also will I spread upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet shall he not see it, though he die thereof. This is saying that God is in it. Who laid the snare? The Lord says, I did. 
who brought the prince to be to succumb in this world in Babylon? God did. It says that he shall not see Babylon, though he shall die there. That's indicating again that he has eyes to see but sees not, right? Didn't God just promise that their own way would be turned upon their heads? Previous chapter, verse 21. Here I believe also it's a, it's a prophecy, and in our Bible we can turn back and look at Zedekiah, who was the last of the kings of, of Israel, who when Babylon came and overtook them, the king forced him to watch all of his sons be killed, and then put his eyes out, so that was the last thing he ever saw, marched him into Babylon, show him off, and there he died. He shall not see it, though he shall die there. Verse 14, And I will scatter toward every wind all that are about him to help him. All his bands, and I will draw out the sword after them. This captivity, this destruction, this divide to the prince and his followers and those that are about to help him is clearly promised and clearly comes to pass. This is all Ezekiel is saying. I'm removing. I'm getting out of here because the princes are wicked. Look at what they're doing behind closed doors. Look at the idols that they've set up in their temples. I am removing from hence. And he's imploring those that are about the prince, helping the prince to get out while the getting's good. What's the end of this? Why is God destroying these leaders? Why is God destroying these hard-hearted people? Verse 15. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall scatter them among the nations and disperse them in the countries. The purpose of God bringing in His judgment is to show who He is and make sure everybody knows I am the Lord. I am in charge. So as Israel... As Israel followed after the rebellious house, became the rebellious house, following after serving other gods, reaping what they sowed as they worshipped stones and then asked the stones for help, the Lord is saying, I'm going to destroy them that they will know that that is stupid and foolishness and they will follow me. They'll follow after God. And he sends his preachers. He sends a few good men that are weeping, mourning for what they're doing. A few good men that are marked, not destroyed in the destruction that is to come. A few good men that fully seek after God. He sets them forth as an example to lead men to realize and know, I am the Lord. He says then, furthermore, verse 16, But I will leave a few men of them from the sword. So a few of those that followed after the wicked prince, that followed after the abominations, that followed after that foolishness in that group. He said, I'll leave a few men of them from the sword and from the famine and from the pestilence that they may declare all their abominations among the heathen, whither they come, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So when God destroys this house, when he destroys the movement, when he destroys the assembly, when he destroys this city, He's going to leave a few, just there as a witness. Those of the dust of the house of Israel, they're there for a witness of the righteous judgment of God. So then not only will the foolish house be reproved and corrected and instruction, instructed in the way of God when they're destroyed, but also their destroyer as they come in. Blast them. Why was it so easy for us to take to it? And they'll say, these are our abominations before God. Hopefully even they, Babylon, will know that the Lord, he is God. He does it all for his own glory. Why don't we skip the pain and the anguish and the frustration and the, and, and, and the, the utter demise and just give him glory now? Follow after him, serve him with our whole heart and avoid all of what's to come on the rebellious house altogether. Let's be like Ezekiel. Gather together our stuff for removing. Let's depart from the ways of this world and do it as a sign as we go. I believe that's what God's challenging us with today. Hear the word, 
see the coming judgment. Separate ourselves fur further. Remove beforehand as we go, be an example to those that are caught up in the trap that the Lord is setting. Everything that we see when we can see the, the you know the, the talons of the devil moving in, trapping people, hard-hearted people, perhaps friends of ours, perhaps f uh, people that we fellowship with are getting trapped and sucked into a mentality that's not of God, sucked into idolatry because that's the ultimate end. They're going to worship the idol shepherd. They're going to worship the antichrist, not believers. But that's that's the direction, right? Hear the word today and remove from them. Remove from the destruction that is coming. And as we go, be an example unto those. That, hey, I just want to serve God. I just want to follow Him. My words are meaning nothing right now. I've said it. I've said enough. I've, I've, I've preached all I could preach to you, loved ones. To you, friends. To you, family. To you, people I fellowship with. I've preached what I could. Now just watch my example as I go serve God.